Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and tonight I am here on my show, Author to Author, with Devin Rose. Devin, um, could you hold up the cover of this beautiful book? Very happy to. Yeah. Uh huh. Lionheart Catholic: How to Become a Saint in These Dark Times, and that is definitely a timely topic. <laughs> so. Um, so, uh, if you would like to open us with prayer, then we'll, we'll talk about your book. Happy to, Cynthia. In the name of the mm -hmm. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for this good day. Pray for your blessing on our conversation and on everyone listening. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. Oops. Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so, um... As I mentioned when I when I saw the the title, I this is something that's important for today, um, because a lot of people are just wandering around um, with no idea of how they should be acting. Uh, they're succumb they succumb to the seduction of current cultures, and so um, I think this uh, this is a very timely topic. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, why did you uh, write this book? Well, Cynthia, I'm I'm glad that um, to hear you say this because uh, that means I don't have to try to convince you that we're living in dark times. <laughs> oh, we are living in very bad times. <laughs> um, and yeah. you know, I wrote the book myself because I felt that same level of confusion, if you will, that mm -hmm. you talked about that a lot of people are feeling. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've obviously had, we have disorder out in the world, which probably yes. that's, you know, that's always the case, but it feels especially bad. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe a difference is, you know, the, we have a, within the, you know, the church, we have this uh, confusion as well. And, um, you know, uh, uncertainty and um, this type of thing. And so when I was thinking back, I thought, well, what, I'm a convert to the faith. I've now been Catholic almost 23 years. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what was it and what is it that I've learned over those 23 years um, or 20 <laughs> years at the time that I wrote this probably, uh, especially from the saints on how to become a saint? Mm -hmm. And I collected together each of those what I call ingredients in the recipe of the saints. But the the kind of the unique thing about the book is um, I don't just say pray the rosary, even though the rosary is one of the ingredients. Rather, yeah. it's here's the story of how I ran into a problem in my life, mm -hmm. confusion, difficulty, problems, whatever. And then this is how this particular ingredient I discovered that helped me with that problem. So that's mm -hmm. what the book is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. I'm also a convert, uh, 37 years Catholic. Oh, wonderful. Of course, I'm old, <laughs> so I've I've been Catholic a little, little bit longer than you. Um, and oh, uh, um, Cynthia, Cynthia, though I have I want I hate to interrupt you, but I have to have yeah. to ask you a question. Yes, you do not need to tell me your age, and you might not want to answer this question. But mm -hmm. it turns out that this year, and in about one month, I'm about I'm forty, about to be forty six, and I'm about to hit twenty three years as a Catholic, which means this is. <laughs> I'm finally actually going to have lived my life longer as a Catholic than as a non-Catholic. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, let's see, 38 and 38 would be uh, 76. So I've already lived half because I'm 73. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and I never regretted it. What never a, regretted and, it. And I know and I know this isn't me interviewing you, but I am just curious, did, what mm -hmm. did you convert from? I was a non-practicing liberal reform Jew. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I converted because my, uh, I'll give you a short story. Um, my husband wanted to take his mother, who was 85, to Rome. She'd always wanted to go. And so I went to do things like the history and the art. I had no interest in it. wasn't I wasn't anti-Catholic. I just didn't have any interest in it. 
And so um, the last day was coming up, and uh, he said, you know, I'd like to go on a tour, all of us. And I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> and I said, okay, if you can find something that has nothing Catholic on it, I'll go. <laughs> In Rome. I thought I was I thought I was safe. I was not. <laughs> uh, I feel like God actually hunted me down <laughs> because um, <clears throat> the only bus trip he could find that didn't have much religion in it was St. Paul. Uh, what was it? It was Rome outside the walls. And there was only one thing, the catacombs. And so I wasn't going to go in. I was going to stay in the bus. But they turned off the bus. So there was no air conditioning, nor was there a bathroom. So I decided to go into the catacombs. And to show you the level of my ignorance, I was walking by these people on the right. They were having mass. I, I recognized that. And I thought, what's wrong with those people? It's not Sunday. Why are they having mass? <laughs> you know? But, yes. um, yeah, I ended and, up... And that, that's, that started your conversion then? That... It, that trip into the catacombs did because i ran into the tour i finally found them you can't walk around in there alone or you'll get lost <clears throat> and um i was listening to this uh i assume a priest um in a cassock i didn't know that's what they called it and i was standing there listening to him really not interested and i had what i call a ticker tape go through my head like typing and it said, the truth, with a capital T, is found in the Catholic Church. And I thought to myself, whoever typed that doesn't understand. Truth shouldn't be capitalized. <laughs> My God, get <laughs> the ignorance. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was standing there and I said, wait a minute. I can't say whoever put that in my head didn't know about the capitalization. Who put it in my head? And it took me about five seconds to figure that one out. And so when we got back, I told my husband, back to the United States, I told my husband I wanted to convert. And he laughed. He thought I was kidding. And I said, no, I'm serious. So I converted. I went to uh, Holy Apostles for a 93 credit master's. I was already a doctor. And then I went to... Uh, Dominican House and got a license. Went back to went back to Holy Apostles and taught for thirty years, and then well about thirty years. And then I just last year um, I left. You know my husband was dying, so I left, mm -hmm. and uh, so I ended up um, working at Pontifex University as the dean of the theology faculty. Now, mind you, this is this is from a woman who says, "Why is T capitalized?" <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Talk about your life changing. I'm just going along, a happy housewife, and all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> turn right around. Well, in in such a such an extraordinary supernatural yeah. uh, way that God, yeah showed you this right very you know few people get i didn't get that mm -hmm. you know something that was that obvious though of course it was mm -hmm. obvious enough but wow yeah. and then a 93 credit master <laughs> well i you know i really think that the reason that he did it uh so dramatically was because otherwise i never would have caught on mm -hmm. you know and so it was like i really did need that slap across the back of the head <laughs> yes know? well in, in in Cynthia, um, so I actually also visited Rome as a I was an atheist, um, and I remember at I think it was at Saint Paul outside the walls. It's wherever the one that it actually has like the chains that Saint Paul yes. is chained up at. Yes. Well, so I'm with this tour group. It's these scholarship students um, that I'm with, and the you know instructor, the guy doing the tour. Um, who's a PhD in whatever is saying, and right there is where St. Paul was chained and all of the students, oh, and they're all taking pictures. And I'm sitting back over like on a bench or on a, just mm -hmm. bored out of my mind. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, a complete um, idiot, uh, if, you know, for lack of a better word. 
Join so, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't I didn't get the ticker tape then, but at the end of that was the beginning of college. At the end of college, I did um, have a conversion as well, and um, now I look back, of course, and laugh at you know, yeah, there you are in the catacombs. I'm there at St. Paul outside of the walls, like uh, another another church, you know, another fresco. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Well, it is amazing um, because for those of us that have those kinds of experiences, I mean, I've only had that one, but um, to have that kind of experience, there there is no doubt. I mean, there's there's no room for doubt at all. There's no way that I could have imagined or even come up with why is T capitalized, you know, and then realizing, you know, it's like right. it, there's no way that came from within me. Right. And especially someone like you, who, who kind of like me was a very, I'm sure, at least you thought you were very rational minded, you yeah. know, nothing supernatural really happens or whatever, you know, and you know, if something outside of the ordinary is happening to you, because those yeah. things don't happen normally. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, this is fun. See now, and, uh, and now I'm, I'm like, Hey, this is great. I'm a, th this is author to author. And so I get to, you know, yep. I get to, to, to learn about you as well, which is, I'm, yep. this is fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. So change my life around though. I'll tell you. Yeah, and yeah. I, I thought you were going to say that then you retired, um, but then you said you decided to be the dean at the Ponti Pontifex uh, University. Yeah, yeah, the, I'm the dean of the uh, theology faculty, and uh, I really enjoy that. Um, but one thing, I, I, I work from home now, which is easier at 70, almost 74. I'll be 74 this month. Um, but... Um, you know, I still put in an eight-hour day, and uh, the students are, are excellent. The courses are excellent, you know, so I, I'm really having a good time doing that. Yeah, which is great. And, and, and Cynthia, I don't want to um, I don't want to derail us anymore, but though I am no. enjoying this very much. Yeah. But I, we, um, uh, we had a, a loss in our family recently, um, and did you yeah. lose your husband? Did he pass away then yeah yeah he had um it, he was actually my second husband my first husband was catholic also and he um he died of uh, esophageal cancer mm. blood out i was alone with him and then um my second husband uh was catholic but non-practicing and that's where it gets really weird because i brought him back to the church <laughs> you know and um, he uh, he died a year. It will be two years this November of uh, heart failure, heart, liver, and kidney failure. Mm, I'm sorry. So, yeah, thank you. But you know, I mean, really, I got him to go back to church. He had no interest, and he had been born Catholic. It's like, yeah, well, come on, we're gonna go now. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. So. And I was able, because I was with him when he died, I was able to get him the last rites. Oh. You know, Thanks so. Be to God. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and Cynthia, I'll, I'll share with you, because it, it does have to do with the recipe of the saints from Lionheart yeah. Catholic. Uh, my 11-year-old daughter, Josephine, um, passed away two months ago oh. from leukemia. Oh, God bless her. Thank you. Oh. And... Um, so, you know, we, we, um, that obviously for us has been very, um, very sad and we're still, uh, oh, yeah. Mourning. We're, yeah. you know, uh, and you understand about mourning. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, our, if I didn't have our Catholic faith, if then I don't know how I yeah. would have handled it. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing worse than losing a child. Well, thank you, Cynthia. And I'm, I'm, um, you know, it, it's interesting because we've, um, of course had a lot of people praying for us and we felt, we felt so many, um, graces from people's prayers mm -hmm. and it's, um, for me, and you probably already feel this way having lived a lot more life, but having someone close to me 
um, pass away, it's made heaven much more real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, heaven, hell, purgatory, death, yep. judgment, the, you know, the four last yep. things are, are feel very real to me. And yep. um, I want to be ready for, you know, my own judgment. My daughter's gone ahead of me. I should have, you know, died before her normally. But yep. I could only tell her this is what I think is going to happen. This is what we believe happens. Mm -hmm. But she's experienced that now, and I'm still down here in, you know, the church militant. Yes. So I'm trying to, you know, clean up my act and be a, a more faithful Catholic so that I can hopefully join her one day. If I believe she's with God, you know, I, I can't say exactly where, but oh. so yeah. lots of need to be, you know, faithful Catholics at this time. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it's, I really, I, I sympathize with you. I can't imagine anything worse. You know, that's, that's really bad. It's really, that's, you know, because it's just against the order of nature, you know. It, it's against the order. No, Cynthia, I want to share one thing from a saint that I was, that, that happened after this. Mm -hmm. And it was St. John Bosco. And there's a book that, um, so he had these dream visions. Mm-hmm. I had probably had heard, I had heard about him one. There's a famous one where like the church is a ship between two pillars. One's Mary and one's the Eucharist. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's his most famous one. But mm -hmm. he had hundreds of these. And I found a, like an online book that had like 2,000 pages of all his dream visions. Um, oh, my word. Right. Well, I couldn't quite read through that. But uh, Tan Books published a book that's 40 of the dream visions of St. John Bosco. Mm-hmm. I read that book, and one of his mm -hmm. dream visions, if you don't mind me sharing, because this is like oh. a recipe of the saints. Yeah, sure. There were two maidens who appeared to St. John Bosco. They're obviously, like, from heaven. He, um, and they're kind of conversing back and forth, and he's almost a spectator. Um, these maidens are beautiful. They're young, but also look extremely mature. And they talk about the, the, the gift of never having lost one's baptismal innocence okay so like picture yeah. cradle catholic baby baptized you know, i was baptized yeah. as an adult so it kind of doesn't fit as well but and then um and then this was very remarkable they quote from the book of wisdom chapter four a passage um in the passage then they say an early death is a reward for the innocent because God takes the child out of the combats of this life and secures them. And this chapter four of wisdom has a passage that basically says this, which I, I'm sure I've read that passage before, never would have connected the dots. Right. Right. Um, and thinking about that, I thought, wow, my daughter might be like one of these maidens now who, you know, never mm -hmm. lost her baptismal innocence. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Connected later, it, it was, can, ever, can anyone ever regain their baptismal innocence? You know, in baptismal innocence, you're theological, so you'll, you'll appreciate this, is not the same as original innocence that Adam and Eve have. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, of course. Um, but and it was the one way that you can recover your baptismal innocence if it's lost is, um, it was specifically mentioned, a woman uh, making vows as a religious sister. Uh-huh. Which I thought was so cool. Yeah, yeah really. That is cool. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so I'm this this is all I've read on it, and I'm obviously not don't have degrees in theology, so I'm not gonna go too far, you know, over my skis and, and get into trouble. Uh but fortunately you're here to check me with anything I say. <laughs> yeah. But that that is really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so um so, uh, do you want to talk more recipe of the saints? Sure. Yeah. So the um the uh now I've gotten into a little bit of trouble, and I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into more trouble, Cynthia. But people, the 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 recipe of the saints is really like non controversial, and um I know that you know you mm -hmm. can see some of this here, and it's things like the rosary, mm -hmm. um reading the Bible and the catechism, novenas, adoration, um, 
a lot of like the standard stuff that we that we learn, right? Like offering your mm-hmm. sufferings, uniting them with our Lord. Yep. Um, and then one of the big ones, which maybe we can talk about at some point, was um, I, I was about 15 years into my Catholic faith when I finally learned about mental prayer. And as a Protestant, I had quiet times where I was, you know, read the Bible and would quietly pray. But then as a Catholic, that wasn't really a thing as much, even though I still read the Bible. Mm-hmm. Well, then someone said, oh, well, you know, mental prayer is the second level of prayer after vocal prayer. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what is it? Well, you sit quietly with God. (laughs) And I was like, well, I think I've accidentally done that at adoration a few times, you know, Mm -hmm. because you got to sit there quietly. Accidentally. Right, accidentally. (laughs) And and then it said, well, but, you know, the saints, especially for beginners, had this, this, you know, kind of five-step structure to help you get into mental prayer. I was like, oh, what's that? So um, all of these things then are not like, they're all things that I think every Catholic should know. And most Catholics who are practicing their faith for some period of time probably learn and pick up along the way. Mm -hmm. But because it took me so long to figure some of them out, like the mental prayer, I thought, well, I want to put that into my book. Um, And in particular, the way that I ran into that was For years and years and years, I was realizing I was confessing the same sins over and over again, every confession. Mm -hmm. It was was one of those where I could have just written down these three or four sins, and every single time, you know, and and I thought, I've I've plateaued spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. Right, which you're not supposed to plateau, right? We're supposed to, like, either get better or get worse, you know, and I I was probably getting worse. Mm. Um, and then it, and then it, um, uh, I read, uh, found a quote from Saint Alphonsus Liguori, and he said, "Every saint became a saint through mental prayer." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what? How you know? How do I do this? And, and um, so in starting to do mental prayer, which I I only started five minutes per day because I was very weak at it, um, and and I was you know, totally distracted, which still is of, of course a problem uh but after some months of doing mental prayer i realized i went to confession and actually confessed some different sins finally mm-hmm. and i thought this is a sign that i'm actually made some modicum of progress yes yes have you come across mental prayer in your you know life already mm-hmm. yeah it's um yeah if if we're thinking of the same thing, just sitting and, you know, quiet and praying and, uh, you know. Yeah, which, which some people say is Catholic meditation, too, but meditation yeah. now has like a secular connotation yeah. to it. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's true. Um, but uh, initially, I think it's difficult because especially in this country, we're always busy running around doing something. And so you sit there for like five minutes, as you were saying, but that seems like an hour and a half, <laughs> you know? So it do, it is something that your, I don't know if your soul can actually be trained, but um, that your soul can be trained in because, um, it's very, very hard, especially I think for Americans to just stop and concentrate and really, you know, think about something, one thing, and just stay with that and not wander, you know, because we're just, we're all over the place. Oh, we're all over the place. Yeah. We and, really- our, and, and we're all like, we're always, you know, I realize too, it's like, if I'm not even just looking at my phone all the time. I'm also just thinking about, well, I need to not like stay busy, but almost like, well, if I'm just sitting here, I'm wasting time. You're not accomplishing anything. I could be accomplishing something. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and But actually, you can accomplish more if you just sit there. You know? Yeah, so that's, that's the and, paradox. Yeah. And that connected with me too, with thinking about these, you know, all these contemplative religious orders, because I've heard, well, they're the ones, you know, 
praying for the world and kind of holding it up. And I was kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, sure, I guess so. Um, but then I thought, oh, I they like pray all the time, both in mm -hmm. choir or, or concert together, whatever you call that, and then on mm -hmm. their own. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they, maybe they are the ones that are as dark as the world is right now. Maybe it's not darker because they're actually uh, mm -hmm. praying, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, certainly, um, you know, I, I do think that although the world is in really rough shape, um, that there are things that are occurring that, you know, that I do believe that saints, living saints now, do do help hold the world together mm. because i mean there's just so much bad right. and every once in a while i'll see something that will really really impress me and you know the the most recent thing which i mean there's i don't know if you saw this it was in a, a magazine i can't remember which one there were these two little baby girls dressed up in dresses and I was looking at him and I said, those are two really sick kids. You know, that was my reaction. I mean, they looked terrible. And then I read that there are two priests somewhere on the eastern coast down south. I don't know which state. I've forgotten. They go to the abortion centers and they take away the babies and they bathe them and they dress them, and they baptize them. And those were two of those babies. And I thought, I mean, I don't even know how to express that level of holiness to, to, to care for, the, you know, we're supposed to care for the dead. Right. These priests are caring for the dead that nobody wants. Their parents don't even want them. They don't. They don't even want to bury their own dead children that they just killed. Oh, wow. you no! Know? And it's like I thought, you know, when you think of that level of strength, you know, that does not come from nowhere. Yeah. You know, and even for it to work, I mean, how they get those bodies, I don't know. But it was right. in a magazine. So it's got to be legal. Or they wouldn't. They wouldn't have had it in there. But it's. Um, it wow. was. It was absolutely. It was one of those moments when you realize how bad things are in this country and in other countries. But you know we're supposed to be the leaders of the free world. You know. Right. And you have priests going around picking up aborted babies so that they can be baptized. And buried properly in pretty and with, clothes. Yeah, with with the dignity, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which is which is so important. And obviously, you, we've read of these abortion mills oh, throwing yeah. away the bodies mm -hmm. of these babies, and which yep. is obviously just you know, garbage. They're garbage. Right. They right, which is um so 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 awful. So like that, these priests are doing that. Um, as a testament to the dignity of the human person and therefore also of God. Yes. Um, and you know, and, and it, and as you're saying too, there's people doing this, um, you know, just like mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity who are picking up, you know, lepers and people with bugs eating at their open sores. Oh. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I was I was reading about that, and then and then I talked to a nun um, of a different order, and I realized I wouldn't make it like five hours as a nun. Well, <laughs> yeah, for a variety of reasons. For for a variety of reasons, <laughs> but uh, and probably the same goes for you know Benedictine religious monks <laughs> or something. But I, yeah. I realized like these people are living life on a different level, and when Jesus said, yes. you know, they're not. Some have forsaken marriage for the sake of the kingdom, become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Um, and we, yeah, they're they're doing that in a in a very profound way. Mm -hmm. It's they're they're kind of bringing a little piece of heaven to earth. And what's interesting is 
it shows you how evil, how strong evil is because those people are hated, mm. you know, right. and they're the ones who are doing the extraordinary good things. Right. Things that hated. no, yeah, that no one should have any objection to, right? right. Like, how, how could you be opposed to this? And, and yet there is a visceral hatred for even just basic goodness. Uh, you're which, right. You're and, right. And, and not that I, I don't recommend this movie. Don't go watch this movie. But before I became Catholic, I watched a lot of movies. And um, one was a movie back in the 80s. And it was mm -hmm. called um, Dragnet. And it had, you know, Dan Aykroyd, who is a comedian. I'm sure Cynthia oh, remember. remembers Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, I remember Dan Aykroyd. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's got, you know, it had another famous actor. Well, the, the hilarious thing was they were battling this evil organization. The evil organization had the acronym PAGAN, okay? And it stood for People Against Goodness and Normalcy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it was obviously a joke. It was so over the top. These, like, pagan yeah. people were just crazy, weird, bad people. Mm -hmm. And that was their acronym. And now I'm like, we have that now, except those are, like, mainstream people yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah people there's there's also you know as uh spiritual beings we have intellect and will and i look at the level of ignorance and it's like i wonder why nobody is saying gee you know i ought to get a little more informed on this you know or maybe i should take a class or something um you know, it just amazes me. Yes, and, and sometimes that can lead, I feel the same way, and sometimes that can lead me to be really discouraged and despair because I just think mm -hmm. people are so clueless about almost everything. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and yet they think because they read a, a headline in, you know, the newspaper or a, they mm -hmm. saw a TikTok video, you know, yeah. that, <laughs> that they know all about, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. And in truth, what, what, they've, what they've learned from that is, sort of like whatever the whatever the narrative has wanted them to believe yes they've accepted now they right yes. they, they have this pseudo knowledge and really they've just been indoctrinated mm -hmm. into something that's completely false yeah yeah right? um in and, mm -hmm. and it's you know we see this um have you heard of you've probably heard of the phrase the overton window which is like the window of public opinion yeah it's like the, you know, so you have this acceptable public opinion, you know, in this Overton window, which has obviously been shifting mm -hmm. in a bad direction, mm -hmm. where people from you know ten years ago, um, who who you know, let's say they weren't, they're not Catholic, they're just secular people, mm -hmm. they go along with with the zeitgeist, right? Whatever the thing is, they kind of do. Well, if you told them, hey, in ten years, you know what you're going to be believing in ten years, and yeah. then you tell them what's mainstream now. I bet you they would say, you're crazy. No, that's insane. Yeah, you know? exactly. And yet, <laughs> and mm -hmm. here we are. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I agree with that. And I do think that things are getting worse uh, and getting worse faster. Um, part of that, of course, is because everybody has access to the mass media, even if they're really idiots. <laughs> But, you know, um, because, you know, I mean, the freedom to speech of free freedom of speech to me should be the freedom of speech to tell the truth or to at least be thinking, uh, not to just um, go nuts. Right. But what happens? Yeah. And um, I, I haven't followed him in a long time, but one of the books that was very important in my conversion from Protestantism to the Catholic faith was uh, Mark Shea's book, By What Authority? So he was mm -hmm. a fellow Protestant convert. This is one of the, there was a handful of very popular, you know, apologetics books in the 80s, 90s, and that was one of them. And, um, you know, on his blog, he used to have the tagline, so that no thought of mine, no matter how stupid, ever goes unpublished. <laughs> and he, obviously, he was joking. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, but I always, you know, I, I always read that and got a kick out mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. But Cynthia, actually, as I've grown in my Catholic faith, and I think you'll appreciate this too. I've it's given me pause before I put something out there, whether I say something 
mm-hmm. publicly or on Twitter or on Facebook or on or mm-hmm. write a book or I write mm-hmm. a bunch of words and I realized whoa if I I might say something that's false yeah right and that's a responsibility because if I say something then I'm leading people into that's error right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, 10 years ago I didn't you know 20 years ago it's like ah, you know <laughs> mm-hmm. and didn't really think about it now I'm in my middle age and maybe I've learned a little a few things and I thought hmm I've been wrong about a lot of stuff in my life. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> right. And you, yeah. you realize that too. And you know, whenever you say that you're a Jewish convert, it made me think of Rosalind Moss, who was a Catholic answers uh, mm-hmm. speaker, or, you know, and, and she was a convert from Protestantism who then, but originally was Jewish. And now she's mother Miriam and she's a nun. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talks a lot about her, uh, the, you know, growing up Jewish mm-hmm. and all the things that they did. And then she became Protestant. I think it was Protestant for 18 years and thought the Catholics mm-hmm. were, you know, not saved and all that, mm-hmm. you know, and now down to the end of her life, she's become a nun. I think she's probably, mm-hmm. you know, in her late seventies. Um, mm-hmm. And she's like, you know, you just, you never know where the truth is going. The truth with the big T is going to lead you. Yep. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You never do know. Um, you know, when I was young, I never would have imagined I'd end up doing what I'm doing now. I mean, that would, it would never have even crossed my mind. If it did, it would have been a nightmare. Right? And I'm curious, what, what was yeah. that original PhD in? Was it in an unrelated field? Uh, sociology of religion. Oh. And, yeah. And what was interesting is I had, I was interested in religion not uh, looking for truth, but in the sense of looking at why people were, um, you know, why people were religious. Interestingly, I'd always been interested in why people are so mean to each other, how they're, I mean, they're awful. And so as a sociologist, I started studying sociology of religion, and all of a sudden, I ca- came to my mind, it's like, okay, well, maybe this is the answer to why people are so mean to each other and so awful. And so I studied criminology, um, which is one of the more depressing social sciences. <laughs> you know, really. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just sad. You know, so many people, they throw their lives away doing stupid things. Mm. But... Um, you know, so uh, it took a while, uh, but I did put two and two together and think that, okay, there is something in religion that is telling us what's wrong. And um, that was really a major breakthrough for me. But and, it didn't. That, that happened before you became Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a mental turning point about. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there is, there is definitely something wrong with us. And I mean, really, when you look at it, I mean, how could you not see that? Because I mean, <laughs> people, you know, people that seem perfectly normal, you know, and the next thing you know, they're beating their kids up, they're kicking their cat across the floor, they're, you know, they're angry because they have to stop at a stoplight, so they run through it. You know, it's like, it's like just one bad thing after another, and, uh, I thought, yeah, something's wrong with us. There's something wrong. And then wrong, I yeah. heard about original sin. <laughs> I thought, you know, there might be something to that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny you say that, Cynthia, because coming from atheism too, yeah, the Christian answer to these things, like original sin, is mm-hmm. actually a much better answer than any of the other world yeah. religions. Yeah. It's It's right. the truth. Right, it's the it's truth, true. and, yeah. and and even then, when you and you know, C.S. Lewis wrote about this in *Mere Christianity* when he said, you know, I looked at all these religions and realized, huh, the unique thing about Christianity is it talked about grace. Huh, that's different. Grace. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. like, in in my view now, it's like it's not even close. Like it's either Christianity, and of course, by that we you know believe the Catholic faith, or it's we're done for. Like you know, no, there's. Mm-hmm. There is no yeah. truth. We're just, you know, glorified animals or something, and we're all in trouble. I don't know. You know, we're all going to mm-hmm. just die, and, and we don't have a soul or some strange thing. Mm-hmm. Well, fortunately, we do have natural law. 
and that helps. It only helps. It doesn't, you know, because yes. you, at some level, we want to do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing, uh, or the good thing, do the good thing and avoid the evil thing. But the problem is we're not smart enough to figure it out. What's good? What's evil? Right. You know? So right. you need that guidance that only, uh, I believe, that only religion can give you. Yeah, well, we both believe that. <laughs> yeah, because maybe I know, like, eh, it's wrong to steal. And I don't have to yeah. be like, you know, I, I know it's wrong to steal. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. But, okay, fair enough. But what if I'm put to the test and, well, I really, really want that. Or yeah. I think I need that. Mm -hmm. Right. Then in what you know, what about in that situation? Um and and then not to mention then like you're saying, it's one thing to know it, um, you know, it's like written on our heart, but it's another thing then to be able to actually follow it. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and part of that means that you have to not bury it. You know, so it's like, well, I should do the right thing, but I really want that hamburger, so I'm gonna steal it anyway. <laughs> right you know yeah. um in, in this by the way actually one of the ingredients of the recipe of the saints is aquinas's theory you know teachings on virtue and basically like a mm -hmm. good habit and when you do a good habit again and again right it's like you're training a muscle or it's like you're mm -hmm. right you're you're ingraining that that makes it easier the next time and you're virtuous in one area it helps you with virtue in another area yeah right like all of these things then that um our catholic faith affords us and i'm actually i'm sort of amazed in some ways that with so few people who are actually practicing their catholic faith things could be worse you know what i mean <laughs> like yeah, they they're, they're bad and getting worse but mm -hmm. you know if i weren't catholic how how well would i be doing in this life i don't know probably pretty bad mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think all of us who are practicing Catholics know that if we didn't, uh, if we didn't live according to what we know to be true, I mean, how can you not live, if you know this is the truth and you say, okay, I'm not going to live according to this. I mean, that is, that is really stupid. Right. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. live according to the false. <laughs> that makes sense. You know? Right. So, yeah. It's, yeah, and uh, that's, and that's the argument I've heard before that like, and actually this has to do with writing especially if you're going to write fiction mm -hmm. even like your evil characters who are doing evil yeah. things have to think that it's actually good in some way yeah right. yeah now they're wrong they're twisted and they're doing something yeah. objectively bad but mm -hmm. it they didn't set out and that i think as much as i i, I think that a lot of our leaders are di quite diabolical um nonetheless yeah. They probably have been twisted into thinking that, no, I really am, you know, I really am helping the nation when I, you know, try to make abortion legal everywhere and punish pro-lifers or, or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. They might think that, or they just might be thinking about how many people will vote for them. Yes. yes. Right. One of, the, one of the most influential things I ever saw, influential on me, that I ever saw was on television the day that Roe v. Wade was, um, uh, I guess, overturned would be the word. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the Supreme Court judges was walking out. And there was this girl, maybe, I don't know, 18. And she was just screaming at him. It was on the news and she was screaming at him. You know, what gives you the right to control my body? This is my body. I should have the right to do what I want to do with my body. And that judge, I don't know what his name was because I'm not really that political, but he said it's because another person is involved. And I was like, I just wanted to jump up and run around the neighborhood going, wee, wee. And it's like, finally, somebody said it. <laughs> somebody in power said it. You know, right, right, yeah, so, and said yeah. it in a timely time to yep. a poor, ignorant, you know, young woman who had just learned slogans. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, somebody ought to write a book about slogans because they do have quite influence, quite the influence in this they, culture. 
they do, which shows us how how easy it is to you know to sway people. Well, now I, now I want to look up that that uh, which justice that was because you yeah you, you got to figure it was um you got to figure it it was one of uh, obviously the uh, you know the pro life uh, voting justices there. Mm -hmm. um, but even you know even you think about that like with the original um, Roe v. Wade decision, which of course you know you were alive for, and it was preceded me by by um, a few years. And you know I went back and read as many people have the 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 court decision. I think it was Justice Blackman was the one who who gave it. And um, even just reading it, I don't have a degree in philosophy. I don't have a degree in you know theology. Um, but reading this decision, uh, it is uh, nonsensical. It's it's terrible from a from a from even just an American. Hey, we're going to like go on the founding documents criteria, let alone natural law, let alone Christian revelation. Right? It fails in every count, and yet it was passed. Because you know, five or six people um, decided, yeah, we're going to do that, and then for forty nine years, you know, up until when it was overturned, this was the quote law of the land. Um, and you know, for as much as we, of course, love our country, you know, it's it's sobering to realize, yeah, something can be the law of the land and be a really, really evil law of the <laughs> land. Yeah, it can, and we've certainly seen that through our history. I mean, you know, no matter how far back you go, you're going to see really bad legal decisions. Right. Um, and that, of course, you know, I mean, I don't even know if you're, if you're, if you're even going to say you're Christian, even if you don't practice, you must have heard a few of the commandments, right? And you would think that the judge would have said, well, this is not in line with you know thou shalt not kill so you know right the only comfort that i get when i think of abortion which is kind of weird i suppose is that i know that once the little spark of life is there that child will live forever you know it is a person even though it might only be two cells or three cells at the time but it is a person, and so that person will live forever. And um, that's right. Yeah, yeah. God, God has ensouled that person right at yeah. at conception. Yep. And Jesus Himself, when He was incarn incarnated, we have to assume started out like we every yeah, person yeah. did, right? In yeah. In that conception, right? He did. He didn't start off as a, as a five year old child or as a no. you know, <laughs> yeah. and, right? Right. And, and it's interesting. I'm reading. I've um. I'm rereading. Uh, though every time I say it, I feel like I'm just reading it for the first time. Uh, and sometimes I want to say trying to read uh, Dante's uh, Paradiso, the mm -hmm. you know from the Divine Comedy. Um, I read the Inferno like first for whatever weird reason as an atheist, but. I'm reading the Paradiso, and then in the Purgatorio also, and of course this is just Dante's opinion, putting people into different circles yeah. and you know all that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, even like kind of the noble pagans end up in this, you know, this sort of blissful light. If if it you know if it's not quite what uh, you know the beatific vision is, it's it's you know whatever. So this was this was Dante's take, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, on the eternal life that people who even preceded Christ, they didn't have the light of Christ, and yet they mm -hmm. were following their conscience or, or you know, yeah. whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those, I mean, you know, are, whenever people have asked me to or, or, or brought things up, I'm like, you know, our Father in Heaven is way, way better than I am. Yeah. He's way better. So, like, mm -hmm. Whatever I think might be generous or good or whatever, he exceeds in every way. So mm -hmm. even if I can't tell you exactly theologically, you know, every single thing, and I think even for some time, you know, even the church hasn't infallibly defined every single thing that, you know, is going to, oh, to be, not. of course. Of course right. not, right? Well, but I have a childlike confidence 
that God, whatever he's decided about everything, is going to be just and merciful mm-hmm. and good. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? no question. Question of that at all. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it likewise then, when people get so mad because see people down here, they seem to get away with great evil and, and such, and I, you know, I'll, I just think, yeah, but that person, when they die, and they will die, because we all will, is going to face ultimate justice, which they can't hide from. Mm-hmm. They can have no excuses. They're going to face our Lord in their particular judgment. So, like, yeah, they seem to get away with it here on Earth, but, they, you know, they didn't get away with anything. No. Um, and no. I can only pray that they had a conversion, because obviously we don't wish hell on anyone. Hell is so terrible. We don't want yeah. the, the worst enemy to have it. Mm-hmm. So, but they're not, you don't get, you don't get away from God's justice. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. No. Oh, but by yeah. the way, Cynthia, I think that we're, we're probably running up on time here pretty shortly. <laughs> okay. Um, well, <clears throat> so this is, uh, I think your, you know, I think your, uh, book will be a success just listening to the way you talk. I think you probably write the same way we usually do. And, uh, you know, um, I think it will be a great success. And I'll, I'll look forward to the next two. Well, uh, Cynthia, let, two yeah, let's, let's have yeah. some more conversations in all. Yeah. I, 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 and I like to talk about the fiction one together in this, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So uh, just give uh, Sebastian an uh, email and you know, give them some idea of when you can do it. Okay, I will do so. Thank you, Cynthia. Alrighty. And uh, I thank you. Would you like to close us in prayer? Oh, yes, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for our conversation, for the Catholic faith you've blessed us with. We pray for the conversion of every person in the world who needs you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, so I'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Cynthia. You take care. Thanks for the interview.